get the soy milk. I do not want to have to yell at another barista for screwing up my order. Definitely. Large flat white with soy milk. Sir, the boss is looking for you and she doesn't seem too happy. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, well, thanks. Excuse me. You wanted to see me? Uh, yes, have a seat, please. I regret to inform you that you've been terminated. Effective immediately. What? Why? I, I don't understand. It's been brought to my attention that the amount in the registers and the amounts in the books doesn't line up. Now, you want to explain to me how this has only been occurring on the nights that you've been closing? Would anybody in here consider themselves to be a good waiter? Like not working at a restaurant waiter, but a good waiter. You love waiting. You're a patient person. Does that describe anybody in this room? Let me give you a little scenario to see if uh, you really are a good waiter. Let's imagine this scenario for a moment. You are waiting at a stoplight, okay? You're in your car. You're waiting at a stoplight. The light turns green, but the car in front of you doesn't move. What do you do? What do you do? I immediately hear honk the horn, right? I asked that question on my Facebook page this week, and a lot of you respond to that, and holy cow, you guys are rude people. <laughs> Some people, though, they were polite. They were like, you know, I would count to 10, and then I would give a little meep, meep, right? <laughs> Don't you wish your car horn was a little bit more polite than what it was? Some people said, I won't count to 10, but I'm going to count to three. Others were like, I'm honking. One person was really honest and said, I'm going to honk twice, yell some vulgarities, and then go around. So I'm like, well, thank you for your honesty with that. Some of you, I know, you're, you're uh, so impatient that if you were sitting in the passenger seat, you're still honking, aren't you? <laughs> Does any, anybody married to someone like that where they honk for you? That's right. Um, here's what I would do. I would actually, when the light turns green, I would wait a moment, but I don't honk. I just yell this, go! I yell it from my car. I don't want to honk because, uh, to be honest, my fear is that it's one of you in front of me, and I just don't want to ruin your view of Harvester Christian Church. Uh, but I try to be patient, but none of us, if we admit, if we're uh, free to admit it, are really good at waiting. None of us like to wait, but many of us end up in seasons of waiting all the time. In fact, some of you, I'm sure, came into this room today, and right now you are in a season of waiting. Now, I don't know what you're waiting on. It might be you're waiting on love. Maybe you're here and you've been praying for God to bring that perfect person in your life and it feels like you've been waiting forever. Maybe you're waiting on a career, or you've got this degree, and you're wondering when you can use it, or maybe you're in your job, but you want to move forward, and it feels like you're waiting, or maybe you're waiting on family. Maybe it's been a prayer of yours that you and your spouse are able to have children, and it feels like it's just been this eternal wait, and you're not exactly sure where to go from there. Maybe you're waiting on health. Maybe you're waiting on healing. Maybe you're waiting for a doctor's report to come back. I don't know what season of waiting you might find yourself in today, but all of us eventually find ourselves in seasons of waiting at some point, and we all respond differently, don't we? We might wait with impatience. We might wait with frustration. We might wait with anger. We might wait with anxiety or a feeling of burnout or emotional instability. And I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know how to end a season of waiting. 
And so if you came today and you thought I was gonna give you some spiritual cliche that would get you out of this, this uh, season of waiting that you're in, I'm sorry, but this may disappoint you. So instead of focusing on how to get out of the waiting, what I wanna spend some time talking about today is what do we do in the waiting? What do we do while we're waiting? In fact, I wanna take some time today looking at the life of Joseph and looking through his story, and specifically Genesis chapter 40. So grab your Bibles, open up to Genesis chapter 40, and today we're gonna learn some powerful truths about what Joseph did in his waiting, in his seasons of waiting, that I think would be incredibly beneficial to our lives. And this is the one big idea I wanna get across today. It's the thing that we learn about Joseph, it's the thing that we can learn about our own lives, and it's this, that when you wait, don't waste the wait. When you wait, don't waste that wait. Now, I don't know when the waiting ends, but I know that there's some things that we can do in the middle of waiting, and we can't waste those opportunities when they come. Now, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 40 here, but let me give you a little context of where we are. Joseph, while he was a young man, when he was 17 years old, he got this dream from God that one day he would be a ruler. Now, where we find him in Genesis chapter 40 is not sitting on a throne. We see him sitting in an Egyptian prison, wondering if this wait is ever going to be over, wondering if this dream that God gave him is ever going to be over. And so Genesis chapter 40 actually starts with these words, some time, which means we don't even know how long he was waiting. But after some time of being in prison, after some time of being trapped, the doors of the prison open not to let him out, but the doors open to let two specific people in. And we're going to look at those two people's lives here. The two people that are let in is a cupbearer of Pharaoh, the king, the most powerful man in the entire world, Pharaoh's cupbearer and Pharaoh's baker walk through the doors of the prison. Now, we don't know why they were put in prison. Something happened. The assumption is that maybe there was some kind of party, some kind of festival happening, and then there appeared to be some kind of coup where somebody possibly tried to kill Pharaoh, and we think maybe Pharaoh was almost poisoned. And Pharaoh wasn't exactly sure who it was that was poisoning him. Was it the person who was over the vineyards and over his cup of making sure he got his wine? Or was it the baker who was over the kitchen making sure that he got his food? While Pharaoh's investigating this, he sends his two top officials into prison. And that's where we see them in Joseph's story where they come in. Let's start with verse 5 and talk about these two people. It says this. One night they both dreamed, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were confined in prison, each his own dream, and each dream with its own interpretation. When Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw that they were troubled. So he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with him in custody in the master's house, why are your faces downcast today? They said to him, we've dreamed dreams and there's no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? Please tell them to me. Now, Joseph, he's saying something really important when he says these words to them. Don't interpretations belong to God. Joseph knows that God sends dreams to people. And he also knows that God is the only one who's interpreted them. Now, Joseph has dreamed dreams, but Joseph has never interpreted dreams. And so while he's in prison, he hears that these two men have dreams, and by the look of their faces, they're incredibly disturbed by the things that they've just dreamt. And so Joseph tells them, I know a God who sends dreams, and I know a God who interprets dreams. Please tell me your dreams. There's three things that we're going to learn about Joseph in his waiting, the ways that he didn't waste his waiting. And the first one is this, that in the waiting, you need to be refined, Be refined in the waiting. And Joseph understands that if you're not gonna waste the wait, in the middle of the waiting, one of the things that you need to make sure happens is that you begin to develop, that you're being refined. And so Joseph, he looks at these these two people who are having dreams and he says, I don't necessarily have this skill of interpreting, but I know the God of interpreting. So why don't you share your dreams with me and maybe I can start to develop this skill to be this mediator between God and the dreams that he sends. And so he asked these two people to tell him dreams. And one of the things that we need to know is that we need to be refined in the waiting. Joseph here, he's refining skills that he is going to use later in his story. 
This, this, this role of interpreting, this skill of interpreting, it's going to come back later, and so he's, re, he's starting to refine that right now. One of the best things that you can do in your waiting is to let God refine you. He can refine you in two ways. Let God refine the things around you, and let God refine the things within you. If you don't want to waste the wait, let God refine the things around you and within you. You see, there are a lot of times when we're waiting that God wants to refine the circumstances around us. Maybe there are skills or abilities in your life that he wants to improve. Maybe there are people in your life that God is waiting to be removed out of your life, or there's people in your life that God wants to put into your life. Maybe there are obstacles to success that need to be removed. Maybe obstacles like debt or distractions in your life. The reality is that the skills and the resources that got you to where you are today may not be sufficient to carry you into that next season of life that you're waiting on. And so God says, in this time of waiting, let me refine the things around you. One of the biggest seasons of waiting that my family has faced in the past few years is uh, in when we went into the process of adopting our son. Uh, a few years ago, we brought home a little boy named Ben, and he's, he's one of the lights of our world. And I want you to know that that was an incredibly difficult season on our family because of the waiting specifically. We went into this adoption thinking that it was gonna be a two-year process when in the end it took us six and a half years. And I want you to know, at the end of that two-year process, we were doing a lot of asking of questions to God. We were approaching God and saying, God, what in the world? I feel like you gave us this vision, gave us this dream of welcoming a kid into our family, and we were at this time adopting through the, the country of Colombia. But we kept hearing news that the Colombian government is all messed up and they're shutting down adoptions and we see the number of adoptions that, that Colombia is uh, doing start to shrink. And we begin to ask the question of like, God, like, what is, what's happening here? And then we get into year three and we're no closer than what we were in year one. And then year four. And then we begin to make a switch to our country and then we see year five happen, year six, and it took six and a half years of waiting and we were incredibly confused at that in the moment. But when we brought our son home, that's when God began to show us the past with 2020 vision then. And we began to see that God was using that time to refine our circumstances. When we, we got to the end of the, that six and a half years and we had to make our final adoption payment, you know how much money we had in our savings account left over after that? $7. That's what we had. Like we had been saving for what we thought was gonna be two years, but God knew it was gonna take six and a half years of saving in order to not go in debt to do this. We also got to the end of that six and a half pro year process and realized that in the midst of that wait, God allowed us to be praying with a whole bunch of people. And he began to put people in our lives and other families who were adopting. And a lot of you in this church, you came into a relationship with Rachel and I during the season because you were going through the same process. And God put the, that around us and he began to refine our circumstances. And we get back and we realize, God, you didn't waste the wait, but in the midst of it, you were surrounding us with people, you were surrounding us with resources, you surrounded us with skills to be able to go into the part of the adoption process that's more important, which is raising the kid, which I'm not sure we would have been ready for a few years ago now that I know Ben. And so that six years was incredibly important to refining our own character. And sometimes God is like, you're in this moment of waiting because I need to refine the things around you. Sometimes God is like, you're in this moment of waiting because I need to refine the things within you as well. Here's a great question to ask when you're in a season of waiting. And I, and I would ask this question to yourself. What character flaws have the potential to become character fatalities in the next season? What character flaws do I have right now? You know what, we're, we're all praying, God, get me onto the next level, get me onto the next stage, bring this new thing into my life, I'm waiting for it. And a lot of times, God has pushed pause on it because there's some things in our life that he knows if you take that into the next season, it's gonna destroy the blessings of the next season. Joseph, he experienced this last week. If you were here with us last week, he's in prison waiting and he's confronted with this temptation of sleeping with Potiphar's wife and God is beginning to refine some character things in him. And so the question we need to ask ourselves is what are those, those character flaws or character deficiencies in our life that if we were to take those into a new relationship, it would destroy the relationship 
Or if we were to take those into a new position, it would destroy the position. One of the joys I get here at Harvester is doing ministry with our young adult crowd. And our young adult crowd, they're in a season of waiting. They're waiting for college to be done. They're waiting for jobs to come. They're waiting now for the first time for the potential of a spouse to come. And one of the conversations we have all the time is uh, they'll ask me, like, will you pray for Mr. or Mrs. Wright to come along? They won't put in those words, but essentially that's what they're doing. They're waiting for Mr. or Mrs. Wright to come along. And one of my pieces of advice to them is in this waiting, don't waste it. Instead of praying for Mr. or Mrs. Wright to come along, Maybe focus on how you can become Mr. or Mrs. Wright in this season. What are the things in you that if you brought those into a marriage relationship would destroy that marriage? Maybe right now is the time that we begin to focus on those things and let God refine the things within. Joseph, he's refining his skills. He asked the cupbearer and the baker, he asks them, tell me this dream. Let's see if I can interpret them. And so he hears the dream, and then he begins to interpret it. And so the two dreams that were, were told to Joseph was the first one came from the, the cupbearer. And the cupbearer, he's distraught, and he looks at Joseph, and he says, here's the dream I had last night. I had this dream that there was this vine that just appeared. And on the vine, there were three branches. And then on those branches, they began to bloom, and clusters of grapes began to grow on them. And he typically has men who deal with these things. He's the, the chief cupbearer. He's not the one who deals with the vines, but in the dream, he reaches up. He grabs the grapes with his bare hands. He grabs Pharaoh's cup with his other hand, and then he begins to squeeze the grapes into Pharaoh's cup, and then he hands the cup to Pharaoh. And, he, and he's blown away. He doesn't know what that means. He does not, he's not supposed to use his bare hands to squeeze grapes into Pharaoh's cup. And Joseph looks at him and says, here's what that dream means. It means in three days, you're going to be released from this prison, and you're going to be restored to your position, and you are going to deliver once again Pharaoh's goblet to his hand, just like it was in old. As he's telling the interpretation of the dream, the baker, he's listening on to this as well, and the baker begins to get excited because he hears that the, the cupbearer is being released. He's like, Joseph, I had a dream as well, and here's what my dream is. Can you tell me how I'm going to be restored and what it means? And he says, this was my dream, Joseph. I'm standing, and there's three baskets of cake on my head. Now, that's a pretty incredible dream, like three baskets of cake. He's got to be excited. He's like, there's three baskets of cake on my head. They're full full of baked goods. The top basket has a variety of goods on it. And in my dream, birds from afar begin to come and they begin to eat the baked goods in the top basket. Joseph, what's my dream mean? And Joseph looks at him and says, it means you're gonna die. <laughs> it means that Pharaoh in 3Ds is gonna remove you from prison and he's actually gonna hang you. But, and then he switches over to the, the cupbearer again. He says, but, cupbearer, here's what I want you to know. When you're restored, I need a favor from you. And this is the favor he asks the cupbearer. He says this in the following verses. He says, remember me when it is well with you, and please do me the kindness to mention me to Pharaoh, and so get me out of this house. Joseph, he's using this moment as a way to free himself from the season of waiting. And so Joseph shows us that we can not only be refined in the waiting, but we can also be active in the waiting. And that's the second thing we need to understand. If we're not gonna waste the wait, it's okay for us to be active in the waiting. Joseph, he looks at the baker and he doesn't say, now that you're gonna be released, can you take a moment and just pray for my release? Can we all just join hands, circle up, hold hands, and just pray that poor old Joseph also will get to be released like you? I guarantee Joseph was praying for his release. I guarantee he was praying in the season of waiting. But what I love about Joseph, if he wasn't just being passive in the waiting, Joseph was being active in the waiting. He saw someone who was getting ready to go free. He looks at him and says, get me out of this house. You're going to be standing next to the most powerful person in the world, who has the power to release me from prison, so get me out of this house. I wonder sometimes when we're in seasons of waiting if Jesus is actually in seasons of going, but we're afraid to make the first move because we think it's unspiritual. We have this assumption that we're most spiritual when we sit and do nothing, 
We have this assumption that we're most spiritual when we pray, but we don't do anything. And I think Jesus actually says the opposite. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 to 8, Jesus says, in your praying, don't just be passive, but be active. And this is how he says it. Jesus, this is the words of Jesus. He says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, it will be open to you. Now Jesus says, in these seasons of waiting, in these things that you're, you're asking for, definitely come before God and pray about it. Spend some time on your knees praying. And then he says, don't just ask, but seek. And seek begins the movement here. It begins the activity where he says, get up and begin to look around and seek if you want to find. But then Jesus, he ups the ante one more time. He says, don't just ask and don't just seek, but sometimes you have to go knock on some doors. You have to go and say, can you get me out of prison? Can you get me out of prison? Can you move me on to what's next? We have to ask, which is pray. We have to seek, which means sometimes we've got to move. But there's a lot of times where God says, I'm just waiting for you to knock. If you want a door to be opened, don't just stand at it and pray. Stand at it and do some knocking as well. Joseph does this all. He refines his gifts. He goes on to interpret some dreams in doing so. He asks, he seeks, he knocks, he does everything right. And then the day finally comes. He said, three days later, cupbearer, you're going to be released. Three days later, his day finally comes. The prison door opens, and I imagine that Joseph begins to wonder, is my season of waiting over? This is what happens in verse 21 and 22. It says, Pharaoh restored the chief cupbearer to his position, and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hands. Joseph was right. But he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. Joseph was right again. And I got to imagine, as Joseph is seeing this unfold, he's beginning to think, my days in prison are over. My days in prison are over. I was right about the dreams. He's standing next to Pharaoh. I asked him that when he's standing next to Pharaoh to, to let Pharaoh know that I'm in here unjustly and to get me out of prison. And he's got to be thinking the wait is over. Freedom has come. And then we read verse 32 or 23 that says this. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. Got him. In seasons of waiting, there's a third thing that we need to do. And we don't actually learn this from Joseph, but I think it's something that Joseph needs to hear in this moment. We need to be hopeful in the waiting. We need to be hopeful in the waiting. Joseph here, he does everything right, and his wait continues. If you read the next verse, the wait continues for two more years. He waits in prison. Two more years. He does everything right. If, if I'm Joseph in this moment, I've got to start feeling a little hopeless. He's been in prison for a long time. He's had these dreams. It appears to be that he's doing everything right, well, right, and then he continues to be in this season of waiting. And waiting can feel hopeless, can't it? When you're in these moments of waiting, these seasons of waiting, you eventually begin to feel hopeless. When you're in seasons of waiting, you're going to see other people freed while you continue to wait. And that's gonna feel hopeless. In your seasons of waiting, you're gonna be forgotten by people. You're gonna be forgotten by loved ones. You're gonna be forgotten by friends. And it's gonna feel hopeless. In seasons of waiting, you're gonna feel forgotten by God. I imagine that's a little bit what Joseph is going through, thinking, God, what about my dream that you gave me when I was a 17-year-old boy that I was going to be ruling for your glory? And now here, here a cupbearer has a dream. I interpret it, and three days later, he's released from it? How can he be freed, and I'm still here in prison? How can I help both of these people and here I am alone now, feeling forgotten by the very people that I've, I've helped free. I've gone out of my way to help people who are forgetting me. God, what about my dream? What about the promise you made to me? 
God, is my dream a lie? Have you lied to me? Joseph has got to be feeling hopeless. And I got to tell you, in seasons of waiting, I felt that exact same way. I don't know about you. And so here's what I want to do. I want to give you a passage that I've held on to deeply in uh, some seasons of waiting. It's Psalm 130, verses 5 to 6. Psalm 130, verses 5 to 6, it says this. It says, I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in his word, I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning more than watchmen for the morning. You know, on, on first reading this, it, it didn't really connect with me on a heart level until you dig into the emotion behind this passage. Of, I don't know who wrote this. I don't know what they were waiting on. But there was something inside of them that was crying out to God of, God, I'm waiting like a watchman for the morning. And, and then in this emotion, he, he repeats it. I'm waiting like a watchman for the morning. And he's talking to himself as if he's trying to convince himself to continue the wait. He says, I wait for the Lord, but not just my body, not just physically I wait, not just in a time and space place do I wait, but it's in the deepest parts of me, the deepest parts of my heart, my soul is the thing that's waiting on the Lord. It's my soul that waits and he's saying I'm waiting for the Lord. He's not waiting on a boss. He's not waiting on a child. He's not waiting on a career. He's not waiting on a promotion. He says, the thing that I'm waiting on, God, is I'm waiting on you. And, and my soul waits for the Lord. My, 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 my life, my being, everything I am waits for the Lord. And in that waiting, it's your word that I put my hope in. I don't put my hope on anybody else's decision. I don't put my hope in any kind of circumstance. Where I'm placing my hope is the promises that you've made to me. Where I place my hope is that I've heard, I've read these promises that you've given, and I believe that they're true. So my soul waits for the Lord. He says, I wait like a watchman for the morning. It's this picture of this, this watchman on top of a city wall at, at nighttime. It's completely dark, and his job is to watch for the enemy to attack the city. And he doesn't know what's coming. He doesn't know when the attack is coming, but his job is to stand there, to keep watch, and to wait. And the only moment of hope he has is whenever he's watching, if he sees the, the ray of sunshine begin to come up over the horizon, he knows that morning has come and his watch is over. Safety has arrived, security has arrived, his waiting is over. And the author says, that's how I wait for the Lord. I wait in darkness. I wait with my eyes watching and ready and active and prepared. And I pray to God for the sun to rise. Because that's the moment I know the watching and the waiting is over. So he says, more than watchmen for the morning. That's how I wait. Church, we are a people of the sunrise. We had promises made to us, and we have promises made to us in his word. And I hold out the promises in these scriptures. I hold on to Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, where it says, At the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. I hold on to Psalm 30, where it says, Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes in the morning. I hold on to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8, where it says, We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. We are struck down, but not destroyed. I hold on to those promises, and I read in God's word that those are promises that were made to us, and so I put my hope in those. I put my hope in the things that I read in this Bible. I put my hope in the, in the story of Noah, where Noah waited for the rains to come, where Sarah waited for her womb to be filled, where Ruth waited for Boaz. Where King David, he wasn't a king, he's this teenage boy and he waits to be crowned king. Where Israel longs for their Messiah to come and sinners long for the grave to be emptied. And I put my hope in the fact that when you read those that they waited, but then there's this fulfillment of promise where Noah waits, but then Noah fills, 
raindrops from heaven, where Sarah waits and then she feels the quickening of a child within her womb, where David waits and he feels the weight of a crown, where Ruth waits and she feels the embrace of a husband, where Israel waits and then a longing of the Messiah comes and Bethlehem welcomes the Messiah and all sinners waiting for the tomb to be emptied. On Sunday morning, they experience the glimmer of hope when the sun rises and the tomb is empty and God fulfills the promises that he made. And now as a church, we wait today. We wait today and we ask and we seek and we knock for these things that we're waiting on, but ultimately, you know what we're waiting on? We're waiting on the return of our Savior. And now like watchmen, we're waiting for him to come. And if I know my God, he'll be here soon. And when he does, everything that we have waited on is gonna come to pass in greater ways than we could ever have imagined. And possibly different than what we imagined, but greater ways than we could ever imagine. And so if you're in a season of waiting, don't give up. We are not a people of sunsets, we are a people of sunrise. And it may be dark now, but we wait on the Lord and we hold hope in his promise and we believe the sun will pierce the dark and one day our wait will be over. But right now, we don't waste the wait. Right now, we watch for the sun to come like watchmen for the morning. We wait like watchmen for the morning. Let's pray. Jesus, we we come and we put our hope in you. And um, God, we recognize there's these desires that we have. And I don't know how our desires line up for your plans for us, God, but we wait. God, we pray that you reveal yourself. And in, in these seasons of waiting, in these moments of waiting, God, I pray that you, you show us what the next step to take is. And God, I also pray for the courage to take the next step when you've shown. May we not wait when you're going. And God, may you fulfill the desires of our hearts, the deeper desires that may be on the surface. Fulfill those with your son, Jesus Christ. But until then, God, like watchmen wait for the morning, Our souls wait for you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.